Hi everyone and welcome to the USMLE channel on YouTube. My name is Dr. Vaxinia and today's video will be on screenings. Screening guidelines are super high yield for the USMLE exams, for the boards and for real life. So let's get started. This video is your one-stop shop for screening guidelines for the USMLE step exams, the boards and real life. I took the time to make slides for you guys so you can maybe take screenshots from the video and keep the, this information on your phones for quick access. Screenings as you know are extremely high yield across all steps and, steps and the boards. For example on day 2 from USMLE step 3 exam predominantly the questions are on screening guidelines so I would highly suggest to take the time to understand the guidelines and memorize them. We start with dyspepsia. In less than 60 year old patients, dyspepsia is defined as postprandial fullness and early satiety. If a patient with dyspepsia presents and they are less than 60 years of age, you must test and treat them for H. pylori with two antigen or urea bread test. Urea bread test being the most accurate test from all. Now here for completeness, I have showed you guys the H. pylori treatment regimens. First line therapy is PPI, claritromycin and amoxicillin. Second line therapy if they are penicillin allergic is PPI, claritromycin and metronidazole. And we have the quadruple therapy, the so-called BMT, which is PPI, bismuth, metronidazole and tetracycline. If the above treatment fails, then you must treat the patient with PPIs for 4 to 8 weeks. And if still symptomatic, you can try treating the patient with TCA, for 8 to 12 weeks. Now tips to remember is not to use claritromycin if patient has used macrolides before or there is local resistance to macrolides more than 15%. In such case what are you gonna do? You're gonna start them on the quadruple therapy as first line therapy. And also remember uh, regarding H. pylori eradication testing you're gonna only test for H. pylori eradication if the patient is still having signs and symptoms after the treatment that you have administered or the patient has H. pylori ulcer. Now how are you gonna test for H. pylori eradication is with the urea bread test or with fecal antigen test. When are you gonna test for H. pylori eradication is 8 weeks after antibiotics, the treatment is completed or, or bismuth. 2 weeks after PPI treatment has been completed and 2 days after H2 blockers treatment has been completed. Then we have a patient with dyspepsia less than 60 years of age with alarm symptoms or a patient with dyspepsia older than 60 years of age. So just to clarify the alarm symptoms, they are defined as um, weight loss, unintentional and significant or dysphagia, odinophagia, iron deficiency anemia, persistent vomiting, family history of GI cancers and over GI bleed. So in order to classify here in this category you have to have dyspepsia less than 60 years of age and you must have more than one alarm symptoms. Or again if you have dyspepsia and you're older than 60 years of age what do you do? This time we don't jump straight to test and treating for H. pylori but we prefer doing upper endoscopy first all right but if for some reason you cannot perform upper endoscopy then again circle back to the previous slide and test and treat for H. pylori. Now we have GERD management. GERD or acid reflux or uh, in layman's terms heartburn is a chronic or frequently recurring epigastric pain burning or discomfort. GERD, as you know probably, is one of the most common differentials for chest pain. And also quick tip for you guys, avoid talking to your patients in medical terms, like you cannot ask a patient, do you have GERD symptoms, right? You can, you have to ask them like, do you have heartburn or acid reflux, etc, etc, so you, you get what I mean. So here, GERD, how do we treat GERD? If they have symptoms, then you're gonna try using PPI BID for 8 weeks, see if that helps. If after this treatment the patient is still having signs and symptoms, then we're gonna perform upper endoscopy to see what's going on. And if the upper endoscopy is normal, then we're gonna perform esophageal pH monitoring. We continue with Barrett's esophagus. As you know, Barrett's esophagus is usually the result of repeated exposure 
of the esophagus to the stomach acid, right? And it is most commonly diagnosed in people with long-term GERD, that's right. So normally the esophageal lining is made of squamous cells, as you know, right? And the stomach lining is made of columnar epithelium. So following that logic, Barrett's esophagus will be an EGD, which is showing columnar epithelium lining more than one centimeter of the distal esophagus and biopsy with intestinal metaplasia characterized with goblet cells. So basically, the stomach lining is transferring going up the esophagus, which is a precancerous condition, which is called Barrett's esophagus. So again, the esophagus is lined with squamous cells. If the stomach lining, which is columnar epithelium, start, starts crawling up towards the esophagus, and it's more than one centimeter of the distal esophagus that you're gonna see with columnar epithelium, and when you take biopsy, the, the histological results show intestinal metaplasia characterized with goblet cells. This is the definition of Barrett's esophagus. Now, as we said, because it's a precancerous condition, you have to monitor it. So, if there is no dysplasia, you're gonna do PPIs, you're gonna treat with PPIs, and you're gonna perform upper endoscopy EGD every three to five years. If the biopsy shows low-grade dysplasia, then again you're gonna treat with PPIs and you're gonna perform EGD every six to 12 months. And if the biopsy shows high-grade dysplasia, then you have to perform endoscopy eradication therapy. Moving on to breast mass guidelines, if you have a female, remember 30 years of age is your cutoff. Female less than 30 years of age with breast mass, you're gonna perform ultrasound first, followed by mammography. In comparison, if the lady is older than 30 years of age, then you wanna perform first mammography followed by ultrasound. This is super high yield. They test you on this. Remember 30 years of age cutoff. 30 years of age less than 30, ultrasound first. More than 30, mammography first. Moving on to breast discharge. Again, as we said, the cutoff is 30 years of age if they're less than 30 years old. And the breast discharge is described as unilateral or any color discharge, remember, except for bloody or serous. Then you're gonna perform ultrasound followed by mammography. Remember, ultrasound followed by mammography. If the lady is more than 30 years of age, and again, the discharge is described as unilateral, but this time is bloody or serous, then you must perform core biopsy. Breast skin changes, again, no surprise here. Again, if you have a female less than 30 years of age, think of something minor or not so dangerous, like mastitis that you can treat. So lady with breast skin changes less than 30 years of age, you're gonna think mastitis first and you're gonna treat with trial of antibiotics. Which ones? Augmentin to cover MSSA or clindamycin to cover anaerobes. If you have a lady more than 30 years of age, then you're gonna perform mammography. Now you're thinking something cancerous here. They're older than 30 years of age, think something more dangerous, all right? So perform mammography first. And if the mammography is normal, still you must perform the gore biopsy to rule out any breast cancer. The breast cancer guidelines are as follow. Here the cutoff is 50, 50 to 75 years of age. You must get mammography every one to two years. If the lady is more than 75 years of age, you want to perform mammography only if life expectancy is more than 10 years. Remember, more than 75 years, mammography only if the life expectancy is more than 10 years. And if you have high risk women, for, uh, for example, if they're BRCA positive, history of chest radiation, or their calculated lifetime risk of developing breast cancer is more than 20%, then you can start with the mammography Q1 yearly at 30 years of age. You can also perform MRI starting at 25 years of age, again, Q1 yearly. And you can also do pelvic ultrasound starting at 30 years of age, Q6 months. Here on this slide, I have expanded more on the breast cancer screening with MRI specifically. As we mentioned, 
in the previous slide here if you have high, high risk women you can start testing them with MRI at 25 years of age so here you can see the risk factors that a lady must have to qualify for MRI screening and I'll read them out to you so we have annual MRI screening based on high risk of breast cancer and high sensitivity of MRI if the patient has a BRCA mutation or first degree relative of BRCA carrier but untested if the lifetime risk is 20 to 25 percent or greater than 25 percent as defined by the BRCA Pro or other models that are largely dependent on family history the most commonly tested family history is two first degree relatives with breast cancer at less than 50 years of age or more than three family members with breast cancer or a male family member with breast cancer or Ashkenazi Jewish person with one first degree family member with breast cancer or ovarian cancer. Now the annual MRI screen based on high risk of breast cancer only is people with radiation to the chest between age 10 and 30 years of age if they have Lifrau many syndrome and first degree relatives with the same syndrome or they have Cowden and Banayan Riley syndromes or first degree relatives with the same syndromes. Moving on to breast cancer treatment here. If the breast cancer is ER and PR, basically estrogen progesterone receptor positive and the patient is pre or perimenopausal, then your drug of choice is tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is selective estrogen receptor modulator. It has competitive antagonism of the estrogen receptors. So tamoxifen can be used for up to 10 years. Side effects that are super heavily tested of tamoxifen is uterine cancer, DVTs and hot flashes. So remember tamoxifen with a T and then uterine cancer, DVT and hot flashes. I hope this helps. If the patient is ERPR positive and postmenopausal this time, then you have to treat them with the aromatase inhibitors, which are estrogen antagonists. The two drugs that are most commonly used as are anastrozole and exemestain. Side effects of these two are osteoporosis because they're estrogen antagonists in the bone, also very heavily tested. If the breast cancer is HER2 new receptor positive, then your choice of drug is trastuzumab. Side effect is reversible heart failure. And if the breast cancer is ERPR and HER2 negative, which is the worst type of cancer, but we still have, of course, medications that we can use in these cases, we have doxorubicin, which causes irreversible dilated cardiomyopathy in comparison with trastuzumab, which causes transient or reversible heart failure. We also have here cyclophosphamide, which can cause interstitial pneumonitis and paclitaxel with the major side effect of peripheral neuropathy. I have put everything on here on this slide because everything is super high yield and you can get tested on. So uh, I didn't want to waste your time by uh, adding a lot of information that is useless. Whatever is on the slide, if you can memorize it, you'll do great on your tests. Moving on to abdominal aortic aneurysm screening guidelines, the so-called AAA. So one-time abdominal ultrasound between age 65 and 75 years is reserved for males who have ever small or males who have a first degree relative who require AAA repair or died from AAA rupture. And again, what are the most commonly uh, tested and the most common risk factors for AAA are male gender, smoking, increasing age and family history of AAA. What is the surveillance of AAA? It is as follows. If the aneurysm is less than 4 cm in diameter, then you're going to do abdominal ultrasound every 3 years. If the size is between 4 and 4.9 cm, abdominal ultrasound every one year and if the aneurysm is between 5 and 5.4 centimeters then you have to perform abdominal ultrasound every six months and the surgery indications for the triple a are as follow if the diameter is more than 5.5 centimeters 
or the aneurysm is growing with more than 0.5 centimeters a year or the patient has signs and symptoms for example abdominal pain and back tenderness moving on to thoracic aortic aneurysm TAA here the surveillance is as follows we can do CT or MRA every one year if the size is less than 4.5 centimeters and you're gonna again do CT or MRA every six months if the size naturally is bigger than 4.5 centimeters. The patient has bicuspid aortic valve, Marfan syndrome or Marfan related syndromes. Now there are some differences between ascending asymptomatic and descending asymptomatic TAA surgery indications. So let's go over them. For the ascending asymptomatic TAA, we're gonna perform surgery if the diameter is more than 5.5 centimeters or if the diameter is more than 4.5 centimeters and the patient is undergoing aortic valve surgery or cabbage or if the size is between 4.5 and 5.5 centimeters and the patient has Marfan syndrome or Marfan related syndromes like Ehlers, Danlos, Turner, etc. For the descending asymptomatic TAA surgery indications, we have perform surgery if the diameter again is more than 5.5 centimeters or the aneurysm is growing with more than 0.5 centimeters per year. Moving on to mitral valve guidelines. The transthoracic echo criteria for severe MR is as follows. If the vena contracta is more than 0.7 centimeters wide or regurgitant fraction is more than 50% or you have regurgitant jet area more than 40% or if the effective regurgitant orifice is more than 0.40 centimeters squared or the regurgitant volume is more than 60 millimeters. The surgery indications for mitral regurg are if you have acute MR for example, after papillary muscle rupture, after MI, or you have chronic primary mitral regurgitation with signs and symptoms, or you have severe primary MR and injection fraction less than 60%, or LVED more than 40 millimeters and no signs and symptoms, or the pulmonary arterial pressure is more than 50 millimeters. Now, the guidelines for TTE surveillance for mitral stenosis are as follow. If the mitral valve area is more than 1.5 cm squared, you're gonna perform TTE every three to five years. If the mitral valve area is one to 1.5 cm squared, then you're gonna perform the transthoracic echo every one to two years. And if the MVA is less than one cm squared, you're gonna perform the transthoracic echo every one year. And as you can see here, more detailed information about mitral valve management guidelines you can find on the, the video dedicated on mitral valve. And uh, also keep in mind that I have other videos on the channel that are dedicated on each specific guideline. Moving on to aortic valve guidelines. Here the most important thing is when to perform surgery for aortic regurgitation. And you have to do surgery if the patient has acute aortic regurgitation or no sign and symptoms with ejection fraction less than 50% or the patient has AR and is symptomatic or the patient is undergoing heart surgery. Lung cancer screening guidelines are super easy and super high yield. You're gonna perform a low dose CT chest between ages 55 to 8 years of age if the patient is current smoker or the patient has quit within the last 15 years and has 30 pack smoking history. Lung nodule screening guidelines. If you have a nodule which is growing with more than two millimeters in diameter within one year, then you must biopsy it because benign lung nodules don't grow so fast. And if you have a lung nodule which is more than eight millimeters, you must be very suspicious of malignancy here especially if the nodule is described as speculated, scalloped, which is lobulated, or the, if the nodule has eccentric calcifications. Again, you must biopsy these nodules. Moving on to latent TB, again another super high yield topic. So first let's define what is latent TB. Latent TB is anyone who tests positive with a tuberculin skin test 
which most of the time and the most commonly tested number is more than 15 millimeters in, in duration, or a patient has positive IgRA tests and negative chest x-ray, or a chest x-ray showing stable cavitation and granulomas. So remember, do not get tricked. If the patient has any of the, these tests positive, IgRA or TST, and they give you a chest x-ray with a cavitation or granuloma, don't jump to treat active TB. Probably this is latent TB, all right? To confirm active TB, you have to do sputum cultures. The treatment for latent TB after you have excluded active TB are three. You have INH, which is isoniazide and vitamin B6, plus rifapentin for three months, or you can give them a rifampin for four months, or you can opt out only for isoniazate and B6 for nine months. And just for completeness, if you have a pregnant lady with latent TB and you have to treat her, then you have to do the following regimen, rifampin plus isoniazide plus etambutol for two months, followed by INH and rifampin for seven more months. Mm -hmm. And again, don't forget to give the vitamin B6 every time you use isoniazide. Diabetes screening guidelines are super high yield as we have pandemic of diabetes in the US. So these are the screening guidelines from the American Diabetes Association. How to diagnose DM is with either HbA1c more than 6.5% 6 or fasting plasma glucose more than 126. Again, what is fasting plasma glucose? It's measured after you have no caloric intake for at least eight hours. Another way to diagnose DM is with two hour plasma glucose more than 200 during an OGTT test. Again, OGTT test is performed with glucose load with 75 grams of glucose dissolved in water. So you drink this solution and two hours after that, they measure your plasma glucose. If it's more than 200, you have diabetes or the patient has classic symptoms of hyperglycemia or hyperglycemic crisis with a random plasma glucose more than 200 milligrams per deciliter. So these are your diagnostic criteria for diabetes mellitus. And how to diagnose prediabetes if your fasting plasma glucose is 100 to 125, the two hour post load glucose, basically the OGTT test is between 140 and 199. And if the HbA1c is 5.7 to 6.4 percent, colon cancer super super high yield. Screen everyone between the ages 50 to 75 years of age with either colonoscopy every 10 years, flexible sigmoidoscopy every five years, CT colonography every five years, FIT and flex sigmoidoscopy every three years, FIT DNA test every three years, and FOBT or FIT tests only every one year. Special situations when we do colon cancer screening earlier than 50 years of age is if a patient has a first degree relative less than 60 years of age diagnosed with colorectal carcinoma or adenomatous polyps or you have two or more first degree relatives with colorectal carcinoma or adenomatous polyps diagnosed at any age. So in these two situations, you're gonna start screening the patient at 40 years of age or 10 years before the age of the cancer diagnosis in the relative. And you're gonna screen them every three to five years. A few words on familial colon cancer syndromes. We have the familial adenomatous polyposis. It's autosomal dominant disease. It's a mutation in the APC gene. You're gonna observe thousands of polyps before the age of 20. So you have to start screening the patients at the age of 10 and repeat screening every one yearly. MAP is a mild version of FAP. Here you're gonna observe colorectal cancer in the 40s and you have to start screening for colorectal cancer at 20 years of age and you have to repeat the screening every one yearly. For HNPCC, which is the Lynch syndrome, you start colonoscopy at age 35, you repeat every one yearly. And for all other cancers associated with Lynch syndrome, you can start screening them at 30 years of age. Moving on to the super high yield follow-up colonoscopy after polypectomy. Screen with colonoscopy every 
10 years if you find small rectal hyperplastic polyps. Colonoscopy every 5 years if you have too small less than 1 cm tubular adenomas. Colonoscopy every 3 years if you find 3 to 10 adenomas or adenoma which is big, more than 1 cm or if you have high grade dysplasia or villus adenoma on the first colonoscopy. You're gonna repeat the colonoscopy less than 3 years if you find more than 10 adenomas. You're gonna repeat the colonoscopy every 2 to 6 months if you have large, more than 2 cm, sisio polyp removed by piecemeal excision. And last but not least, you have to repeat the colonoscopy every 2 to 3 months if you have a polyp with adenocarcinoma and 2 mm invasion margin. Osteoporosis guidelines. Who gets DEXA scan every 10 yearly? Women more than 65 years of age and men more than 70 years of age. But who are we going to screen with DEXA scan every 3 years as you can see here who are less than 65 years of age, both women and men. So. We're gonna screen these people if they have clinical risk factors for fracture. Advancing age, parental history of hip fracture, low body weight, current cigarette smoking, excessive alcohol consumption, or secondary osteoporosis, for, like risk for secondary osteoporosis, like if they have hypogonadism, premature menopause, malabsorption, malabsorption syndromes, chronic liver disease, or inflammatory bowel disease. Other patients who are at high risk are those who have fracture after the age of 50 years and those with chronic conditions, for example, rheumatoid arthritis or taking a medication that predisposes you to developing osteoporosis like steroids in a daily dose more than 5 mg of prednisone or equivalent for more than 3 months. So who is going to get treated for osteoporosis? Postmenopausal women, specifically if they have established diagnosed osteoporosis, which is a T-score less than minus 2.5 at the femoral neck or spine, or women with osteopenia with T-scores between minus 1 and minus 2.5 with the FRAX major fracture risk more than 20% or FRAX hip fracture risk more than 3% patients with fragility fracture and those who have history of vertebral or hip fracture. Now the treatment options as you can see here are several. You have to give everyone vitamin D and calcium. Vitamin D is 800 international units and calcium is 1200 milligrams daily. Then you can treat them with bisphosphonates PO which is oral route. We have alendronate Rizedronate and Ibandronate or with the IV zolendronic acid if they cannot take PO bisphosphonates. Then we have anabolic agents like teriparatide or abaloparatide. You can also use the serum raloxifene and you can also use bone modifying agents which are monoclonal antibodies. We have the medications denosumab and Romosuzumab. Prostate cancer guidelines, the one and most important thing you have to remember for your test and for your future clinical practice is do not perform digital rectal examination as a screening for prostate cancer. This is old news, no one is using that, don't do it. Possible screening for prostate cancer can start at the age of 50 to 75 years of age only if life expectancy is more than 10 years and if the patient requests a DRE exam and the DRE is positive for nodule with asymmetry, then you have to refer them to urology. And if the PSA, which is the prostate specific antigen, is between 4 to 7, you have to repeat the PSA in several weeks. Also remember that the 5 alpha reductase inhibitors will increase PSA. And if the PSA is more than 7, then you have to refer to urology again. So whatever abnormality you find on prostate cancer screening, chances are on the test, they will have to, they will ask you to refer them to urology and in your clinical practice, of course, you're going to do this anyways. Now possible screening starting at age 40 for prostate cancer include patients who are high risk, right? For example, men with BRCA1 or 2, the carriers of BRCA1 or 2, or high-risk men which include uh, African-American people, 
family history of prostate cancer then you can initiate screening at the age of 40 but again remember you don't have to screen for prostate cancer but you cannot deny a patient's wish to be screened for prostate cancer so if they request you to perform DRE or test for PSA you can do it you should do it cervical cancer screening simplified for more detailed screening guidelines please refer to my uh, separate video dedicated on cervical cancer but the most important things here very quickly you're going to start screening for cervical cancer at 21 years of age remember you do not screen for cervical cancer less than 21 years of age regardless of when the girls have started their uh, sexual activity so even if they have started their sexual activity at 15 years of age you do not screen for cervical cancer until they turn 21 all right, so we screen for cervical cancer from 21 to 65 years of age with pap smear every three years or you can um, perform co-testing with pap and HPV DNA testing every five years starting from the age 30 to 65. If you find ASCUS on the pap smear, you will have to repeat the pap smear every one yearly and if the next year the pap is still ascus then you have to refer them for colposcopy if you find a low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion or lsil then you have to refer for colposcopy if the lady is pregnant you can still perform the colposcopy now or six weeks postpartum if you have high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion the hsil if they're less than 24 years of age, you're going to perform colposcopy or colposcopy with Lee procedure if they're less than 24 years of age. In cases of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, CIN, if it's low grade, which is one, and the patient is more than 24 years of age, then you're going to perform PAP and DNA every one yearly. If it's a grade two or three, which is moderate and high grade cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, then you have to perform lip or cryotherapy. If the lady is pregnant here with CIN two or three, you have to defer therapy postpartum. And how do we test for cervical cancer patients who are HIV positive? You have to perform the pap smear and HPV DNA testing at the time when the HIV diagnosed diagnosis is made and also if the cd4 count is less than 200 again you have to perform pap smear with dna for hpv every six months the depression screening thankfully has been very much simplified now we have only two questions that we uh, need to ask from the patient health questionnaire phq2 so the questions are as follow over the past two weeks how often have you been bothered by any of the following problems little interest or pleasure in doing things and feeling down depressed or hopeless so it's very easy interest hopeless unhealthy alcohol use screening so let's first define what is a standard drink standard drink is 12 grams of ethanol 5 ounces of wine 12 ounces of beer or 1.5 ounces of 80 percent proof spirits so what is unhealthy alcohol use after all for men less than 65 years of age is more than 14 standard drinks a week or more than four drinks on any day for women is more than seven standard drinks a week or more than four drinks on any day the single item alcohol screening question is how many times in the past year have you had five and four for women or more drinks in a day test is positive when the response is more than zero or when the patient state they can say for sure the audit c screening test is comprised of three items on excess consumption if you want to be more thorough after the single item alcohol screening question first question is how often do you have a drink containing alcohol and the, the patient can get four points max second question is how many drinks containing alcohol do you have on a typical day when you're drinking and the last question is how often do you have six or more drinks on any occasion and the test is scored positive when the responsive three or more points for women or four or more points for men to clarify something the cage questions which are like have you ever felt uh, you should cut down on drinking have you uh, 
Have people annoyed you by criticizing your drinking? Have you ever felt bad or guilty about your drinking? And have you ever taken a drink first thing in the morning as an eye opener to steady your nerves? The so-called CAGE questions are geared towards diagnosing substance abuse and dependence. And here these questions that we went over are for unhealthy alcohol use. The pneumococcal vaccination guidelines are the last guidelines I want to share with you guys. Um, as you can see here, the video dedicated on the pneumococcal vaccination it has more than 34,000 views already. So let's go quickly over them and you can watch the complete video for more details if you would like. So the PCV13 vaccine is given in four doses for who? For babies, for infants at months 2, 4, 6 and 12 to 15 months. Again, PCV13 vaccine is a standard pediatric pneumococcal vaccination. All right, you give them at babies at 2 months of age, 4 months of age, 6 months of age and between 15 and 12 months of age. The special recommendations for pneumococcal vaccinations between the ages 19 and 65 are as follow. If the patient is current smoker, alcoholic or has chronic heart, lung and liver disease, you're going to give them PPSV23 one dose now, then follow standard guidelines as we're going to discuss below. And if the patient has CSF leak, cochlear implant, you're going to give them PCV13 first, followed by PPSV23 one year later, then follow standard guidelines as below. And what are the standard guidelines for pneumococcal vaccinations? Everyone who is more than 65 years of age has to get pneumococcal vaccine. Now, if the patient is vaccine naive, you have to give them PCV13 followed by PPSV23 one year later. If the patient has received pneumococcal vaccine, at the age 65, then you have to give them PCV13 one year later. That's easy, right? Now, if the patient has received the PPSV23 less than 65 years of age, and when are you gonna qualify for this vaccine is in this situation here, the special recommendation section. So if they have received the PPSV23 already, then you have to give them the PCV13 at age 65, followed by PPSV23 one year later. And please remember to keep five years between the PPSV23 intervals. So that's all from me for today. I hope you find this video useful. If that's the case, give it a thumbs up, share it with your colleagues. Good luck on your exams and I'll see you on the next video.